Alright, okay, so uh, while this stuff is fresh in my noggin, I'm going to endeavor to do a video um, on <clears throat> the current Marvel Cinematic Universe material uh, that's been out this week and uh, recent weeks, and also, uh, well, what I think about them, my first reactions, etc. Uh, these are phase four. Uh, films and television series uh, of the MCU. Um, I've been having some sound issues, so I got to remember to do this to get closer to this microphone over here and, and to speak a little louder and maybe not, you know, mumble or trail off as often. Uh, I have a bad tendency to do that. So uh, I think I just did it. Um, so I hope this turns out okay. Uh, the John Lawton video, the first like five, 10 minutes are just. Horrible. I mean, you can put on closed captions uh, if you want to see what I'm actually saying, even though they get some words wrong in creative ways there. It's like autocorrupt. Uh, I mean, autocorrect, which we all love um, when a machine knows how to spell better than we do, but uh, and, and but doesn't spell it correctly. Um, so let me think. Where do I want to go first? So first, I'll just do Black Widow, get it out of the way so that we can have a nice leisurely chat about the Loki series, which uh, concluded today uh, with episode six. So Black Widow, I saw several days ago, uh, my dear friend, Dwayne Cochran, who I've known for God knows how many years, man, uh, 28 years. That's insane. Um, we met working at, Bar at Barnes and Noble bookstore together. And uh, he hooked me up with a Plex account. Uh, if you're not sure what a Plex account is, uh, Google it. Um, <laughs> won't take me any long to explain it. Uh, but basically, he 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 has uh, access to uh, a lot of uh, television and uh, film materials uh, ahead of everyone else. Uh, you know, like before they're in the theater or while they're still in the theater and not on streaming yet or video. Um, and then other things he just adds to the channel, you know, and uploads his collection. So they have like a digital library. And, uh, and <clears throat> so he, he gave me my own offshoot. So I kind of made my own, excuse me, my own playlists and, and such. Um, so, you know, I'll isolate a few there that uh, I won't have an opportunity to see anywhere else. Um, that's where, for instance, I saw uh, the only place I was able to see uh, for free. Zack Snyder's Justice League. I'm not saying that's a great example of, of, of Boone that Dwayne has uh, blessed me with, uh, but I, you know, I I've reviewed it on this channel. I didn't utterly hate it, um, but I wouldn't have watched it otherwise. Uh, you know, that soon I wouldn't have been able to see it that soon. I mean, he he put it up while right when it was going to uh, live on uh, whatever cable channel broadcast it. Um, so same with Black Widow. Black Widow came out uh, on July 9th. Yeah, and uh, Dwayne had it up by that afternoon. Uh, very nice copy. So um, Dwayne's the man. Okay, so Black Widow. Um, I expected I would like it. Um, I actually loved it way more than I, I expected to. Um, great cast. Uh, we'll get into that in a sec. And... Um, just a quick recap in case you're not sure, because there have been several people online who've given it kind of bad reviews. And uh, one mistake a couple of guys made was saying that, well, it's not that great, but what do you expect? It's just the origin story of Black Widow. It's just setting up the next movies. And I'm like, well, in a way that's true. But if they mean the Natasha Romanoff Black Widow, no, it's it is an origin, kind of an origin story. They're told in the flashbacks. Uh, the series takes place a few years back in MCU time, but it doesn't. It's not origin. It's just uh, her reconnecting with some people from her past, which give way to the flashbacks and and shed light on her origin. Um, I hate to you know split hairs on that, but. Um, these people, these band bros, are merciless, man. Uh, you got to get your facts straight with them because they will just tear into you. So uh, it's um, 
Yeah, I guess they did, don't know that in the quote unquote present day of the MCU, Black Widow is deceased. Uh, so, by the way, this is this video is going to have five million spoilers. So, if you haven't watched Black Widow yet, which I know a lot of people haven't, and or haven't watched any of Loki, or at least the conclusion of Loki that came out today, you know, and hate spoilers. Just go ahead and, you know, avoid this. As Eleanor Neal says on her channel, you know, when she brings up certain questionable, potentially offensive topics or sensitive or too violent or too sexual, uh, she says, go ahead and click off and uh, it, I, won't, I won't have any hard feelings. I'll see you in the next video uh, uh, at another time for something that's more appropriate. Now, mind you, I didn't try to imitate her incredible uh, British accent. It was extremely distinctive. Um, because I just thought that would ruin the whole thing. Uh, but that's what she said. Uh, so same here, you know, click off and whatever. But I really don't want people to click off. I don't want people to watch. So, uh, but like I say, I mean, some people don't want to hear any spoilers. Some people don't care. Some people, you know, I don't even know if there are any people watching this to, to really matter. Um, <laughs> but I will say real quick, my, uh, review of Kim Key Duke's Mobius uh, film. Um, it says 150 views now. And uh, it's been posted for about three weeks. And that's the most views of any non-Twin Peaks uh, video I have done since I started doing these regularly in September of 2020. I'm not sure what it is. Uh, I'll have to examine the, examine the phenomenon in more detail another time in case it, it persists. I'm hoping it's just a weird thing and the other videos start to see increase in views um, instead of just that one hurtling into the stratosphere. Okay, so Black Widow. Um, it takes place uh, between Civil War and uh, Infinity War. So we don't see it on camera. In Civil War, but we assume from the end, uh, near the ending, where Tony Stark is uh, kind of giving everyone a dressing down for, you know, uh, being not on his side, being against him, you know, and he's got a, well, he didn't really do it, but General Ross, uh, or whatever he is now, Secretary of State Thaddeus E. Thunderbolt Ross, um, this clown, you know, imprisoned uh, the members of the Avengers who. Uh, did not want to sign the Sokovian Accord. Um, and Black Widow sided with Tony's side, who did sign initially, but uh, then she kind of switches sides on the battlefield and uh, just attacks more in a defensive, uh, a holding off kind of way, keeping at bay uh, way Black Panther. And of course, then they exaggerate these into these insane charges, you know, like attacking a prince, a foreign national, you know, whatever. Anyway, so so what we've seen is she's a fugitive, uh, but she's not with Captain America, uh, Falcon, uh, and the others, uh, Wanda, uh, yet. Uh, she will be by the time of Infinity War. Uh, sometime before Infinity War, she hooks up with them. And they actually show in this movie, they fill in several holes about how she got where she was at certain times. So this is, you know, a really nice um, kind of, uh, I was going to say bookend, but that's not the right word. Uh, it's a nice kind of um, previously untold, you know, uh, story uh, that kind of slots in between uh, Civil War and Infinity War. Uh, it's like a mid-war break. So, uh, you know, this one explains, you know, how, why, how and why she looks the way she does in Infinity War with the shorter blonde hair and the, uh, the greenish vest. Uh, you know, all those are plot points in the movie. Well, the blonde hair really is just kind of an afterthought. And also how she got the, the, uh, the um, plane, uh, which her and Steve and, and Sam fly around in. Um, how she got that. So, but coming off of Civil War, you know, basically the beginning starts with Ross trying to apprehend her, and then she manages to kind of sneak away, uh, being the great spy she is, and um, 
there were many rumors that Robert Downey Jr. would be doing his last turn as Tony Stark in this movie, if only as a cameo, but there's no Robert Downey Jr. and or Tony Stark in this movie at all. I just want to clear that up. Um, so probably now a lot of people are like angry and not going to watch it. No, I'm kidding. But um, yeah, I don't know. I think the rumor was started on purpose by, by Marvel because they certainly didn't stop it. Uh, I guess it was a hoax uh, to provoke interest. Um, but, you know, since the movie came out over a year later than it was supposed to, uh, at this point, it really didn't matter too much. So the movie needs to stand or fall on its own merits. And uh, it's making a pretty nice amount of money back in theaters that are you know, getting going again after COVID. Um, but uh, initially, there was positive there was positive feedback online and then uh on, of course on social media facebook uh, especially uh now there's all these nitpickers and naysayers and so i just want to say on the outset i well i said it already uh i loved it a lot more than i thought i would um it's probably one of if not the maybe darkest and most violent like viscerally violent uh movies in the MCU. Um, and I'm not saying it's graphic gore or anything. It's certainly not the level of the Netflix uh, uh, television series that take place in the Mar Marvel Cinematic Universe. I mean, because, you know, Daredevil and, and Jessica Jones get pretty brutal at times in their fights. And especially Daredevil, I mean, has had some pretty intense violence and gore um, uh, in the movie. I mean, in the show. Uh, so it's not like that. But it just has a more adult tone, um, maybe because the characters they're dealing with are overall more in the human range, uh, like like the characters in the Netflix shows uh, are on the human range of abilities and uh, and uh, you know that kind of thing. Uh, and you know it's, it's ironic I'm bringing up, or maybe not, but I'm bringing up Daredevil and Black Widow and comparing them because you know uh, when I was a child. Uh, small child there you know i've talked about wanda and, and vision and how much i love them since i was a kid and also captain america and the falcon well daredevil and the black widow were also sharing billing at the same time so this is like the swing in 70s here and uh by the by the end of the 70s you know natasha was written out um she had been a co-star in the book for maybe a year or so before she got her name and a little uh, spotlight on the covers but that is, to me, one of the great eras of, of Daredevil, uh, Jerry Conway, and then it's like weighing into Steve Gerber, who's always, you know, always brilliant. Um, and that's how I kind of fell in love with the Black Widow, was that show. I was like Daredevil. I was like, wow, you know. Um, they had a very stormy relationship, uh, but you get the feeling that they probably had some intense sex. Uh, and it seemed more credible and mature than her relationship with Hawkeye prior to that. Um, and yeah, there is an issue where Hawkeye and Daredevil fight over her. Uh, initiated, of course, by the hot headed Hawkeye. So, um, yes, so this is, you know, it's, it's, it's just a lot of action, a lot of, uh, killing. Um, there's some kind of brutality that's really unique to this movie that I haven't seen. I have not seen any MCU movies and it was, refreshing to see it if that's the right word i mean it was repellent but it was also uh you know it was pretty cool that they they took it to this level but uh the villain in this film was played by ray winstone who you maybe i'm just i don't see him a lot in movies but to me he was unrecognizable i'd forgotten he was in the movie and so i had to look up who plays the villain uh Dreyev or dre because i can't remember his name he ends with the dr typically menacing kind of russian name so I don't know if he hails from the source material material or not, uh, but he uh, he is a brutal, sleazy son of a bitch, a very misogynistic, and uh, he does beat women in this, and some of them are some of our stars, and doesn't hold back. Um, you know, it doesn't go into torture porn or anything, but uh, it could, you know, if this were a different, how different really rated movie, because certainly his intent it is to punish and cause pain and torment on women. He basically has taken over the Red Room program, which the original Soviet Union had used 
starting in, well, with our characters that start in the mid-90s. And the movie opens with a flashback to 1995 and then goes forward to 2016 for the rest of the movie. But 20 in the 1995, um, we learned that Natasha, young Natasha, was part of kind of a foster family. It was like a sleeper cell in America now of Russians. Uh, I think they're in Iowa or Ohio or whatever. Sorry, Northwest. Um, so the thing is, uh, the father figure is Lexi Shostakov, played by David Harbour from Stranger Things, who also was in the Hellboy remake. I like him, even though I did not like the Hellboy remake. Um, but I, yeah, yeah, I loved him at Strange Things. So you know, he, it's good to see him kind of—he's kind of an unconventional leading man. So it's cool to see him joining the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, Shostakov is kind of a character who didn't make but a very few appearances in Marvel uh, before he died. Uh, he was introduced in the mid '60s, I guess, toward the later in the Roy Thomas John Buscema era of Avengers. Uh, in issues 43 and 44, we learned that not only is he kind of the Soviet Union's answer to Captain America uh, as the Red Guardian, but also he was uh, really married to Natasha. Uh, and then they kill him off. And then really, he's only in flashback. But there's later a female Red Guardian who was an uh, extended player in the Defenders series by Steve Gerber in the 1970s, uh, where they flesh out the Red Guardian concept a bit more, though her character ended up going in a really crazy direction under David Kraft. It was painful to see and read, and not not because I don't love Dave Kraft, I did. Uh, but basically, her character became I don't, know, I don't know if corrupted is the right word because she didn't end up being evil, but she got messed up <laughs> and you know beyond repair, and so it changed the entire tonality of the character from Gerber's version and. Uh, but crafted it smoothly. I've mentioned Dave in one of my previous videos. Recently, he passed away, and, and I, I love the guy. I love his work, and I liked him as a person. Um, so anyway, this is the original Red Guardian from those far away, long ago uh, Marvel days in the Cold War era. And, uh, you know, of course, it's, you know, updated. So, you know, mid-90s rather than mid-60s. So... David Harbour's Shostakov, of course, is not Natasha's husband, but he is more of a father figure. Uh, and his his wife for this mission uh, is uh, Milena. I didn't catch her last name actively there. Played by Rachel Weiss, who I found out was 51. I thought she was like 40. Um, Harbour's 50, 46. So uh, she's definitely old enough to be a foster mother to Natasha. Um he kind of is, that's a stretching it, you know, he's 10 years older in her life, but he's put, I think he's playing a character at least 10 years older than he really is. And within the MCU, the Red Guardian was dosed with a variant of the Super Soldier formula. So you get the impression that he became the Red Guardian when he was originally, you don't see any footage of it, flashback, when he was very young, and this was during, before the Berlin Wall came down. So still during the Cold War communist era that this began. Now, Natasha is too young in the MCU now to have really been active during the uh, actual original Cold War. Uh, but, you know, she was a Russian spy. And, of course, uh, in the 90s, there wasn't that as much tension with Russia and America um, after, the, after the, the wall came down. But, of course, there's an enormous amount nowadays. So it's, it's still kind of timely, and the Red Room Project is kind of depicted as kind of this covert thing where, you know, they, they mention it a bit good in the Avengers films. Uh, they train all these uh, young girls at a very young age. Usually they're like runaways or, or um, kidnapped girls. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty compelling story the way they do this. And uh, this is a very female-driven movie. The uh, director is female, and um, the whole the Black Widow program, well, they call them the Widows. They don't call them all the Black Widow. Uh, that's just Natasha, but there is a new Black Widow. Well, I'll get to that. Um, the Widows from the Red Room, that whole program, you know, they basically raise them from children. They sterilize them, which they got into in Age of Ultron and go into detail in this movie. Um, a lot for a, a PG-13 movie. I was, I was happy um, to hear about it. Um, 
But uh, I mean, not because it's a great subject. I mean, but you know, they start talking about radical hysterectomies. And my mom had a hysterectomy at 32. She had endometriosis. Uh, so I, I heard all this when I was very young. And uh, so it was interesting to hear uh, young Florence Pugh uh, playing, uh, talking about it. Uh, I'm going to get to her in a minute. <clears throat> I have a lot to say about her. So, um, yeah. So anyway, you know, they just basically dispatch them around the world to do missions and spy, spy and, and uh, infiltrate and I guess, you know, maybe destabilize and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, they are st still spies. It's just they're not representing like a nationalist or communist uh, per se government. Um, it's kind of more like our covert, like the CIA and that kind of stuff. You know, you could argue is tied in with the government inextricably, but that's another subject. Um, Rachel Weisz character, Milena, uh, is briefly in a black, black widowish costume and also a little more longer in a white one, which you see Scarlett Johansson in, in a lot of the posters. It really, Scarlett's only in the white one in one scene, and, and she's dominantly in black. Um, it's kind of a bait and switch. They actually, they literally switch clothes, the two of them. Um, you're not sure if Milena is a good guy or not. You're not sure if she's, uh, because she stayed with the Red Room and worked under this Dreyev or whatever his name was, Ray Winstone. So, you know, uh, the rest of the uh, fictional family they had in, in America for a short time uh, begins to think she's a traitor to them. But actually, she's she's infiltrating. You know, she's really on the side of Alexei, the Red Guardian, and uh, Natasha. And Natasha's uh, foster sister, who was the final component of this uh slammed together nuclear family pretending to be Americans in the 90s uh, is Yelena Belova and she's played by Lawrence Pugh who starred in Midsummer, of course uh, which is a film that you know indie fans and horror fans and A24 film fans you know uh, pretty much talk about non-stop online and you know I mean I've had people tell me only a few months after it came out that it was their very favorite horror movie of all time I and mean, people who you know, have seen a lot of horror movies. Now, I personally, I can, I don't want to say I can take or leave it, but it didn't move me in that way in summer. But I will say this, I liked it better than the director's Hereditary, which I didn't hate or anything. Uh, but I'm just, on, I'm not convinced Ari Aster is just this incredible master of cinema after just these two movies, uh, or even of horror cinema. But he is above average, and, you know, he's kind of a newer... I don't want to say a newer voice because I'm not sure he's really saying anything. Uh, in Midsummer, yeah, I don't know about the Hereditary. I don't know. Um, but anyway, Florence Pugh is incredible in Midsummer. Her acting's amazing. I'd never seen her anything before. She's small and kind of pixie-ish, coquettish, uh, adorable features, and not really exactly beautiful, and, and not just you know, uh, I don't know. Yeah, she's she's like this. Yeah, she's like this like tiny, like pixie. I mean, I don't usually get into blonde women, really. I mean, I'm like into her because she's really got a following. Um, but I really, I do like her look and I love her acting. So in this movie, she, I think she even goes further than Midsummer. I mean, maybe not the emotional depths, but there are a lot of emotional depths in her character, and she does a great Russian accent through the whole thing. Uh, David Harbour and, and Rachel Weisz do, do serviceable ones. Um, they're, you know, Harbour's entertaining, and his character, you know, he's kind of almost a caricature um, Russian dude. Um, but, again, if you think of when his character came to prominence, what era, i.e. The, the late Civil War, a, as uh, the champion of Russia, their Captain America, uh, then his personality makes total sense. He's a, he's a type of character that we've seen a lot of in the movies. They, they're the evil Russians we see in this movie that we've seen a million times. That's Ray Winstone's character. But, you know, he's kind of the jolly, loud, you know, eccentric Russian guy. You know, he's probably going to be swigging back vodka and, and, you know, quoting Tolstoy. And I don't know, you know, I'm, see, I don't, I'm not even up with the stereotype. And I grew up around those. But, um He's amusing, and the Red Guardian costume is pretty good, but, you know, they, they make a joke out of the fact that, you know, Harbor has a dad bod, so in other words, which I do too, pretty much. 
Uh, he's not like a real muscular guy, though he did tone up when he did Hellboy. But part of that's with him with makeup. But um, but that's cool. It makes him more accessible and more more relatable. I think uh, and certainly in Stranger Things, uh, that was part of uh, seemingly part of his appeal, even with you know with women and and, and fans like that. But um, so he's carried that over. So it's like he, his costume barely fits. It's really tight. They have like a little humorous montage. There's a lot of humor and and wisecracks, especially among this little reunited uh, faux family unit. Um, the scene in 1995, I mean, Yelena is just a very little girl, and Natasha's, I want to say maybe 10. Um, she's got dyed blue hair, um, and they get busted. Um, and I guess, you know, I don't know if it's the government or the military, our government, whatever, learns that they're really... Uh, sleeper uh, agents or what, but I'd have to go. I have to watch the movie again. But it's kind of a frenetic thing, and basically it breaks up the whole project. They 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 all flee back to Russia, but they all go in different directions. Like I, I no two of them stay in contact, uh, as I, as I, if I've got that correct. So Lexi just basically spends his life drinking and and trying to relive his glory days as the Red Guardian prior to this mission. Um, he is superhumanly strong, like Steve Rogers' Captain America is in the MCU. Um, but, and we see that early on. I mean, these guys mess with him in this prison that they break him out of. And, yeah, he's definitely superhumanly strong. And, and he can leap. And, you know, he's, he's got pretty good reflexes. However, he's not, he's kind of gone to see. He's not the greatest fighter. The villain in the movie, Taskmaster, uh, who is pretty formidable because Taskmaster can... Uh, in the comics, they called it photographic reflexes, which, you know, don't exist, but um, basically can kind of, the brain can analyze, the genetically engineered brain, engineered by Ray Winstone's character, uh, can assimilate, like, instantly the moves of uh, any kind of fighter. So, I mean, they've watched, uh, Taskmasters watch videos, I guess, and, and then fought against some people. So, like, for instance, Taskmaster has a bow and arrow and is just as good as Hawkeye. Uh, has a shield and is just as good as Steve Rogers. And all of that was in the original comics of the Taskmaster when he was introduced in the Avengers as a villain. Now the background or the the vibe of the character, other than being a formidable kind of uh, fighter and killing machine, that's that's the same. His look is the same, but the the background of the character, the tone is very different. Taskmaster is not like a shadowy leader kind of villain like he has the comics kind of mysterious but in this one he is more working for uh Dreyev or whatever his name is he's more of a subservient and we learn why that is and we learn that he is really a she and Olga Kralinko who played in a few action movies herself uh Assassin Next Door was a good one I saw a while back um she uh she plays Taskmaster you don't know until well into the movie that uh, the character she's playing is um, the daughter of our villain. Natasha thought she'd like blown her up training it as a villain. Like it must have been one of Natasha's first missions because she was a little girl at the time. And now you know, I, don't, I mean, I don't think she's supposed to be as old as Olga is in real life, but she's definitely an adult. So some years have passed. You get a better fix on Natasha's chronology. It's not exact. It's still kind of loose, but you can kind of reconstruct it now. You, I would say that when Black Widow died uh, in the in the movies, and not and that this isn't just because of the five year blip or whatever, uh, she's probably at least five years older than Scarlett Johansson is in real life now. In real life, in, in the present day, twenty twenty one, she's thirty six. So, you know, the the uh, end game uh, took place in twenty twenty three, I believe. And the modern ones are in 2024, probably. Uh, so she lived, say, to 2023 when they, you know, uh, had the giant battle at the end of Endgame. Could be 2022, but I, I think it's 2023. So in, tw in 2023, she's probably 40 or in her early 40s. Um, so let's see if she was born in 1985, then, yeah, that makes sense. Late Mid 40s, maybe. Okay, so glad we got the. Oh no, well, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, late end of your 30s or early 40s. 
So I'm glad we got that straight now. Anyway, <laughs> um, Yelena Belova has gone on to become an agent. Uh, and a lot of it is made of the fact that, you know, uh, the villain has, you know, you know, he's raised these girls and he's subjugated them. And apparently Elena Belova joined the program, independent of Natasha. Uh, Natasha apparently uh, spent more time spying in America and, and Europe. And I suppose that's supposed to account for the reason she has absolutely zero Russian accent, uh, whereas all the other characters do. I guess they spent their time in Russia and she spent most of her time away from Russia. Uh, but she's, you know, she is Russian. But now I think we have a little more insight into their rationale for not uh, having her sound Russian or any of that. Um, I never heard her in my head in the comics as having a Russian accent. But then later I'm thinking, well, surely she did. Uh, in the Marvel superheroes cartoons from the mid 60s, she did. Um, so yeah, Elena grew up, uh, as a as a spy assassin, you know, et cetera, too, and she's incredible. Even though she's a smaller girl, she's she's she brings it to the fights, and you know, her and Natasha have a fight right away, and then kind of you know make up. They get closer as the movie is on. There's a lot of antagonism between them, and some of it's humorous and some of it's dramatic. Um, and of course, then they play off of uh, Red Guardian uh, and a little bit off Rachel Weisz. Weisz's character is a little more subdued. Um, so making Alexi Natasha's father, quote unquote, rather than husband, uh, I would say the counterpart to the original Black Widow, uh, who was married to Red Guardian in the comics, you know, that era, the, the, the uh, Cold War era, uh, Milena, Rachel Weiss's character, is kind of a, an analog. And when you see her in the black outfit, you definitely get that vibe, you know, that she was kind of, uh, back then, kind of what Natasha has become. But they don't really get her a lot of fighting scenes or, or you know, she's she's a really good supporting. But, you know, if you want to see a lot of Rachel Weisz, you know, acting and, and et cetera, then this isn't the movie. But um, but Florence Pugh steals the film. Uh, she's not only adorable looking, but like I said, she's totally charismatic and incredible actress, enormous range. And, you know, this is kind of her big she had a critical break with uh, i think she did a shakespearean movie i could be totally wrong and then she did midsummer which broke her into another audience she became more well known but this is kind of her giant commercial leap forward um and uh you know it, she's well deserving so uh and she is going to be a continuing player in the in mcu uh if you haven't figured it out by now or you don't know the comic book uh, history um she's going to take on the mantle of the black widow from Natasha, I don't know if she will join the Avengers or not, but uh, she is going to have some involvement with the Avengers. She's going to be in the Hawkeye television series on Disney Plus. Uh, she is work going to be working for Julia Louis Dreyfus's character that I mentioned in the Falcon and Winter Soldier videos, um, Countess uh, Valentina Allegra de Fontaine, who seems to be kind of like the next Nick Fury. That's kind of what I pegged her at. Anyway, this is. More evidence of that, this in this movie at the very end. The very end takes place in like the present, was it 2024, like I guessed. Um, and uh, uh, Valentina is giving um, Yelena an, a, a chance to avenge her sister's death and blaming it on Hawkeye. But, you know, I mean, it's not Hawkeye's, you know, it's not his fault. And of course, you know, uh, Valentina had no clue what went on on that distant planet with the, with the soul stone or whatever. Um, so it's kind of a manipulation. But, you know, Fury manipulated the Avengers into getting together. And, of course, in the comics, you know, Valentina was Fury's lover and, and partner. So she's kind of the next Fury. I've talked about her in the Falcon and Winter Soldier. So, yeah, they're, they're making her character a, a kind of a prime mover kind of character. Um, and Yelena will be kind of taking the back black loose slot. Uh, in the comic books, uh, within the uh, Russian government and whoever was employing Natasha originally, before she went over to the Avengers and S.H.I.E.L.D., this is in the in Daredevil, this is in the comics, uh, she was succeeded by a younger uh, Black Widow, and, and she was also called the Black Widow. She was Yelena Blova, and they've translated the character great. They've translated, I mean, the, the characters that, you know, that I know from canon are well serviced, especially Elena. I mean, she's more likable than the comics. She's not quite as overtly sexy, uh, but she 
she does look like her and she does have her skill set and obviously she's going to hopefully have a better fate than the Elaine in the comics because Brian Michael Bendis completely fucked that character up uh, prematurely as he, you know, always did almost always outside of Daredevil and Jessica Jones is fucking up some poor Marvel character. So, uh, Oh, that's probably a controversial comment, but anyway, um, yeah. So I really liked it. Uh, a lot of action, some good drama, some yeah, comedy, uh, it just, it moved really fast. It kept my attention. It was interesting because it had layers and, uh, flashbacks and, you know, you know like a, as I'm telling you all this, you know, it's kind of like a puzzle you put together what happened when with who and how these characters are related to each other and, and how they feel about each other. And by the end of the movie, you know, uh, Natasha says, you know, I, I, she'd constantly been saying the Avengers were her only family. So she kind of says, no, I did have two families and one was the Avengers and, you know, so the other one really was the the faux family uh, from the 1990s. Uh, she does feel real affection for Alexi and Milena, and uh, but not as much as uh, I mean Milena, yeah, but not as much as Yelena Belova. Uh, Yelena, I mean, she tries to be kind of tough and macho too, like you know, fuck you to the Red Guardian when they reunite. But it's obvious after a while she becomes very emotional and she's. Since she was such a young girl, it was more impressed upon her. Like, this is her parents. This is her sister. So, you know, for all intents and purposes, uh, the, the two Black Widows are sisters. So that wasn't in the comic. But it's a, to me, it's cool. I love the way they've done this. Uh, there's a richness to this movie I wasn't expecting. There is one kind of throwaway character who I guess is kind of an eye candy kind of character. Um, I can't remember his name. He had a very strange, <laughs> strange name. Um According to my friend Tim Tolbert, he's he's got a pretty good dramatic pedigree. But basically, he's like a next Shield agent, the Good Shield from the Good Shield. Who I can't remember the term that you use a lot for this kind of person. But basically, he's someone that Natasha goes to for intel, information, you know, gadgets, things. He gives her the plane that uh, Natasha ends up using in Infinity War uh, to get around with Sam and. and Steve. Um, and, and their scene is, you know, they, they he's there when she first takes the new look of the blonde hair and she has the vest. And actually the vest was Yelena's. Uh, she wears in this movie over the white Black Widow outfit. And um, for whatever reason she's parted with it and Natasha uh, keeps it and she ends up wearing it as part of her old outfit in uh, Infinity War. I don't know what the meaning of that was. I know what the meaning of it was within the Black Widow movie. I'm not sure what the meaning of it was, why she held, why she held on to it, but why she wear, wore it as part of her attire. Uh, it's not very flattering on her. Uh, it's not a real flattering color anyway, but you know they, they make kind of a running joke about it, having a lot of pockets and being very utilitarian. So it works for Yelena, uh, but you know it's kind of like in the Wolverine origin movie where they create a backstory for how Wolverine got the leather jacket he's wearing in X-Men. Uh, so, you know, the untold story of the green vest is another origin that's told, another setup. Uh, it is a setup for Black Widow. I mean, in that sense, that's true, the statement that I kind of ridiculed earlier. Uh, but it's not true of Natasha. And there's a lot of ignorant people out there who, who hate on Marvel, and, and that's certainly their prerogative. Uh, it becomes an obvious thing after a while. Um, like if I'm a if I'm a highfalutin art film fan, got you know guy like in the A24 film group on Facebook, uh, I'm you know duly obligated to despise uh, the, the uh, lowbrow uh, commercial crap that is the Marvel Cinematic Universe. This isn't my opinion, but this is what's put out there by many many people in that vein online and, and elsewhere critics. And, you know, I don't want to say fuck them, but I don't want to fuck them. You know, I mean, it's like if they don't get it, uh, for what it is, then that's, you know, that's their deal. That's fine. Uh, I don't like blockbuster movies either. I don't like soulless franchise movies. I, I, I ridiculed these movies going back to my teens. I didn't like a lot of movies that were, made during the 80s that were mainstream. I like, I like a lot of them more now than I did when they were coming out. I shoot a lot of them as mainstream and eh, stayed away from them. And the 90s was particularly bad with those kind of 
shitty movies, uh, and I still hate those movies, but, um, <laughs> you know, they're very solo, so I won't name any I have on other videos. So, um, I don't see Marvel the same way, but then there's another layer with me being so familiar with all the way back, you know, when I was two years old, being exposed to Marvel Comics, and, and really arguably doing it during its second heyday, um, during the silver, late Silver Age, Bronze Age of comics. Um, so, it's always going to have a resonance with me that it probably wouldn't have with those people who had never read the comics or maybe never read any comics. Uh, they're, they're not going to care about how the characters are laid or how they translate to the screen. And that's totally legitimate. Um, so I know a lot of people who like the MCU who, who never read the comics either, but they like it for itself. Now I've said this before in another video, uh, films, films that are ad adapted works like from a comic book or a novel, uh, or a remake of a prior filmed iteration. I have two criteria. How does it stand up as a film on its own merits, and how does it stand up as an adaptation? And the two many times do not dovetail. Um, there's been some great adaptations, uh, tra you know, showing the, what really happened in the comics, but they weren't really great movies. Um, and conversely, you know, there have been... Uh, some great movies that that really strayed very very far needlessly so usually from the source material the mcu is a mixed bag in this uh aspect but overall to me the majority of the whatever 25 works we have now in the mcu canon uh the majority of them i think succeed as films on their own merit and as adaptations and translations of the marvel stories and vibe so cool you know win-win for someone like me so anyway check out black widow uh i don't think i've left anything out of import it doesn't have like a whole lot of subplots or anything like that uh, only the ending is the only real setup that goes into the mainline uh, mcu going forward in phase four uh but you know it, it's kind of overdue for there to be a female star female-led uh, superhero movie under marvel especially since they dc beat them to it with wonder woman um, but also for that character, the popularity of the character, and of course the popularity of, of Scarlett Johansson, who, you know, some people say may, may have made up to $15 million in this movie. She's the highest paid actor, actress on earth right now, possibly of all time, uh, which kind of boggles the mind a little, but it also, it also is cool that she plays a character like Natasha and doesn't like sneer at the, the source material, the genre stuff. So, and she wasn't uh, under the skin, which is a very idiosyncratic uh, indie science fiction movie uh, released by A24. Uh, and you would never think she was in that kind of movie, but she is, and she's amazing. Um, I've, I reviewed that on this channel uh, quite a while back. So Black Widow, check it out, Under the Skin, if you get a chance. Uh, I'm going to wrap up because I don't want to make a huge epic length one. I was going to do both, uh, but I, this is just going to be Black Widow, and then I'll, I'll do one on Loki. So thanks for listening, and let me know in the comments if I forgot something or got something wrong. Uh, I don't think I did, but, you know, it's okay. I, I, I want to be correct about all this. Uh, but just don't tell me, you know, that Black Widow was just kind of a dull, uh, mediocre um, origin movie. Because, you know, th think of some other reason you didn't like it. But I appreciated the slightly more adult tone and uh, with the violence and the allusions to uh, the characters. You know, unfortunately, being being sterilized in that horrible misogynistic program, and also the way the villain abused the women. Like I said, I didn't like it, but I mean, I, I respect Marvel for going there and having a character that he's really probably the most repellent degenerate villain there has been in, in a MCU movie. Uh, and so it's not so much the screen time or how well known the character or how well known the actor is in this case. It's just that when he's on camera, he, he's an apex of scum. So, you know, I've got credit Way Winstone and the director uh, and Marvel for having the balls to have a character this, I mean, beyond irredeemable. I mean, you know, nice, not, makes Thanos look very gentlemanly uh, by comparison. I mean, it almost makes the Red Skull look like a, a sweetheart, you know, among MCU villains. And we know Loki's more an anti-hero now. But I'll get to him next time. So thanks for watching.